Here we are, Jim. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome all, and thank you all for your attendance this morning um, at the planning committee. Um, we, the, the one subject on on the agenda this morning, which we'll come into, is the um, public and stakeholder consultation on placemaking (SPG). But the first item on the agenda: Are there any apologies for absence from Councillor Richard Lewis, Chairman? Okay. Thank you. Um, Item two, any disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests? Are there any? No? Okay. So we move on to that main item then, which is item three, is uh, the approval for us to decide of the public and stakeholder consultation on placemaking SPG for residential mm -hmm. developments. So I'm going to hand over to um, Stephen or Tom, first of all, uh, you wanted to introduce the uh, matter. Tom. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I'm only going to speak very briefly. Uh, it's, it's really just to, uh, to, to put this series of documents in the context for, for, for members um, to explain that there's going to be a series of these uh, special committees arranged through, of course, the next few months, the rest of the year, um, really, to, to pick up on some uh, individual planning guidance items. Sometimes we'll be coming for you to seek approval for public consultation, like like today on, on the three documents that Stephen and Christina will take you through. Sometimes it's uh, going to be a matter of uh, seeking your approval to adopt the final versions of, of certain documents such that they can become formal planning guidance and we can start using them in uh, in planning decisions. So the first one of those where you, uh, the committee has done has, has done that on, on, on previous uh, documents, but we have got one coming up in a couple of weeks now. Uh, we'll come back with the SPD relating to biodiversity enhance, enhancement and on a conservation area. And for those ones, will be um, will be requested that they be uh, they be approved in their final version uh, and, and, and adopted. So um, that's um, that's all I wanted to do really to explain that there is you know to be to expect there's going to be a, a number of these coming up and I hopefully people will agree this is the best way to do it through these special sessions rather than tagging them on to the development management committees. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the way that we're, we're set up to work here on these teams meetings working so well and we can just um, uh, we can put them in, in the diary and, and deal discreetly with each uh, uh, with each document. So that's it from me and I'm going to hand over to uh, to Steve to, to begin to, to, to set out the, the detail of the documents that are before you today. Thank you Tom. Steve. Okay, um, thanks, Chair. Um, hello, councillors. Um, there is still a bit of an echo, so if I could ask if, 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 we, if you're not speaking, could we put it on mute for now? That might be better, so it's easier to, easier to hear. Thank you, thanks for that. Um, yes, yeah, so th there's one item on the agenda today, which is the presentation of this draft updating placemaking guidance for residential developments, which is effectively split across three documents, which is appendices A to C. Um, in your agenda pack. So there's a lot of information there and what we've done, we've got a presentation that I'll put up on the screen in a moment that takes you through um, the content of the documents um, and also reminds us all why placemaking this term is so important because this is going to you know, be, be the phrase that we're using continually and it's a really important phrase and even more important on how we build back better in terms of our after, after COVID. Um, there is one update to the um, draft documents which has been circulated as an update sheet I think this morning or late yesterday afternoon um, and we will cover that at the appropriate point in the presentation when um, Christine is talking through her slides so I will just share my screen okay hopefully you can all see that on your screens which should be the, the slide of the presentations there yes um, I'll issue Yes, thank you for that. Um, OK, so yes, before we go into the actual documents themselves, I think it's really important just to refresh ourselves, um, you know, kind of what this term placemaking means, because it's really, really important. Um, and it's not something that's specifically local to Swansea. It's a national requirement that's been set out by um, by um, the Welsh Government in their Planning Policy Wales document. So it applies around the whole of the country to all planning authorities. And there's a quite a long quote there, which obviously I'm not going to read up, but I've highlighted some sections in bold 
And the important points to note, for example, is placemaking is the holistic approach to planning and design of the development of, of spaces and buildings, and it's focused on those positive outcomes. So it's not about process planning, um, and it's not about just making those short-term decisions. And one of the key things is to you know make sure that these decisions improve the lives of the current and future generations. And what this does, it joins up um, the places that are created and shaped through planning and how that relates to people's prosperity, their health, their happiness and their well-being in that truly wider sense, which is we all know this, but it's making sure that this is you know, part of the planning process, that good places are good for people. Hopefully you can hear me OK, I've got a network quality thing there. Um, so and it's it's not just the council, it's developers, it's and it's also important at all scales. So we know that the, 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 the Copper Bay development, the arena, um, Swansea Central Phase 1 with a fantastic new coastal parkland, that's a regionally important placemaking project. But it's also important in these smaller scale day to day projects, those neighbourhoods, those communities. So it is isn't just for the big high profile projects. And it's also important to make sure placemaking is addressed at that earliest possible stage. So it's not something that can be bolted on at the end and making sure that it's looking at the whole place, not just that bit within the red line. So there's a really important definition there that applies to the whole of Wales, to all councils. And the reason primarily why it's so important nationally, because it is the key function of authorities, of the planning authorities to, to deliver the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So we've got the graphic on the right hand side there, which you'll all be familiar with, with the seven goals, which I'll briefly just run through, which is prosperity, resilience, health, equality, cohesive communities, language and culture, and globally responsive. So that's what should be driving all of our decisions as a public body. And on the left hand side in the bold, there are those five ways of working that can effectively make sure the authority addresses those, such as preventing things, like I've given a few examples there, surface water in new developments, how we you know hold back that water with the what's known as sustainable urban drainage, integrating services, as I've mentioned, the health benefits from well-designed places, involve involvement. In terms of community and stakeholders, it might be who, you know, sort of existing residents, but also thinking about who are the future residents of these places going to be. Collaboration, so that's working across disciplines, the one Swansea approach that we are, you know, are really embedding in everything we do in the council, working across departments, but across agencies, and also long term. We're not just looking for something that's going to be built and that's it. These, these places will be standing in 100 years time, and that legacy of well-designed places is really important in terms of what we all do. So. Coming a little bit more up to date, this document here is July 2020, which is obviously was um, basically launched after the first lockdown, so during the pandemic. And what this is emphasising is what well, is placing greater emphasis even on is the importance of placemaking. Um, and because we've all spent time in our neighbourhoods and we all know what works or maybe what doesn't work, the, the access to a garden, the access to good quality green space where we can do our recreations within the lockdown restrictions, um, the access to you know homes that have got sufficient, sufficient space for families to coexist for these long periods, space to work from home. Um, all these things have really focused on what is the planning system creating and conversely maybe the things we don't want to do anymore. So the, the important quote, but obviously a very important quote from Julie James that they've forwarded to this document, but there she says, now more than ever we need to think about places and placemaking. So it's not about relaxing stand, it's actually about emphasising and placing greater emphasis on placemaking. And further coming up to date, September last year was the launch of the Placemaking Charter for Wales which was put together by Welsh Government Design Commission for Wales um, and multi-agencies to make sure that these kind of principles of placemaking are embedded across multiple actors. So councils and the development industry, housing associations, all these people or all these entities that create places, signing up to these pledges around you know, people and community involving them in the design, getting the location right that doesn't depend on private cars, designing for walking and cycling, mixing up uses so we make an efficient use of land, good quality public realm and a place with a clear identity. So this is you know, the current agenda and our design guides fit perfectly into this agenda. So bringing it back down to the local level, um, we've been doing this since, since 2014 when we launched our first residential design guide. So these aren't new guidance, they're a, a, a refresh of existing guidance and we were pushing the placemaking agenda before Welsh Government. So that shows how Swansea's shown leadership in these matters. 
and the placemaking process is embedded from the ODP from the start. Yeah, you know, we're very clear what we don't want to see more of are these cul-de-sac extensions, uh, placeless developments where everybody has to drive everywhere and they are not good places. And very much the ODP is what's known as a placemaking plan with these key policies. There's a policy for placemaking at all scales, which is policy PS2. Um, there's a policy for master planning, which is on the larger sites of 100 or more homes, which is SD2 there. There's also specific placemaking policies for those strategic sites, some of which have um, been to planning committee in recent much, such, months, sorry, such as Park Mauer, Garden Village, Langevelach, and there's more that are being um, you know, discussed with potential developers. Um, and what the placemaking guidance does is it, su it supplements and expands on these policies. Um, so in terms of these current four, current three guides that we've got there, the front covers are at the bottom. Um, the householder one actually dates back to 2008, and then the other two were launched in 2014. Um, they're used day to day by development management officers, by the placemaking team, that's myself and Christina, and the strategic planning team, which we've recently been merged with, to um, just assess and negotiate and write up a multitude of applications and they'll be referred to in the committee reports that come before yourselves. Um, they're well received and acknowledged by many developers, designers and agents and that's the way the development industry is moving. They know that, they're, that the, their residents, their customers who buy the homes want well designed places. The guides are given significant weight by planning inspectors that if we do have to refuse applications, the applications are often dismissed by the inspectors placing weights on these supplementary planning guidance documents. So you might ask, if it's all good, why do we need to update it? Well, obviously things have changed since those documents were first launched. As I mentioned, well, the, the abbreviation there is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It needs to hook in the tie into the correct LDP policies because they were originally adopted to the unitary development plan. There's growing agendas that we need to more centrally embrace around active travel, which is walking and cycling, green infrastructure, this emphasis about living with nature and green space, and the SUDs, the sustainable drainers, etc. There will, there will be more, but there's things we need to update. And also we've been reviewing some recent developments and there's a lot of things that do work, but a few things maybe we want to slightly change the emphasis of. So learning from what's happening out there in terms of the actual places that are being constructed. So in terms of the draft updated guidance, which is in the uh, agenda pack, um, appendices A to C. We're still keeping it as the three separate documents. So for the larger major developments, 10 up to 100. Then the infill document, which is typically up to 10 homes, very much in existing communities, filling in gaps um, to existing streets or backland areas. And then the householder guide, um, which is about exist altering existing houses. If we were to amalgamate them into one document, that would be very unwieldy and people would have to trawl through sections that just aren't relevant so it's because for those different scales. So I'm going to talk through the draft updated residential design guidance or resi for, for residential developments, which is sort of subtitled places to live, very clear of what we're seeking to achieve there. Um, if you're familiar with the existing document, it's got these 12 sections and we're keeping these 12 sections, slightly changing some of the titles such as this section here, section C, which you can see me highlighting, was previous or is currently, because that's the extant document at the moment called natural heritage, and we're changing that to blue or green infrastructures. So that's the emphasis on the sustainable urban drainage and the green space and the natural environment considerations that go with that. So it's a little bit of refocusing some of the titles, but we're still working from the strategic considerations of neighbourhoods and then the structure of a new place, bearing in mind this could be 10 up to many, many hundreds of houses or homes, sorry, down to the detail. So we, we, we so we're looking at places in this structured way and we're not zooming into the detail at the first stage. Um, we are also emphasising the importance of spending time for design that you don't get good developments through difficult negotiations and the importance of involving communities so as we heard as we saw earlier on that quote the place making is something that needs to be addressed up front it can't be bolted on at the end so it's talking to those residents around the area those communities around an area it's properly understanding the site and its context and looking outside the boundaries and it's making use of the very well set up pre-application service the council offers that's the place where we can do all the negotiation and design so when it comes as an application it should be a very well thought through project which is well supported by these design and access statement documents that really bring the project to life 
So those 12 sections in the updated guide, the first one starts off as the importance of neighbourhoods. We are creating neighbourhoods where people can establish communities or we're linking developments into existing communities. And it's about these cohesive and healthy communities. So that's what the, the, the big idea behind this place making guidance. It's also about walkable neighbourhoods. So you, you, you can do your local trips via foot or cycle if you so wish, and you don't have to, you don't have to depend on the car. And it's about thinking, you know, not just everywhere being the same, having a distinct heart to that place. Where is the centre um, and what facilities are there for the community there? Often the Victorian suburbs of all of our cities across the whole of the UK or got this right. They were planned before mass, you know, basically private travel, both cars, and they were walkable neighbourhoods. They had facilities, the schools, the shops at the heart. And it's not necessarily turning back the clock, but it's re you know, regenerating that basic vision for a Victorian community, walkable neighbourhood in the current um, time. So another example here, which you would have seen before, which is Park Map which is the outline planning application that was approved a few months ago by um, actually maybe a bit more than that six months ago so by planning committee this is the heart of that new place there's a new school over there there's a business like shops on the ground floor of these units here with flats above and there's a there's a new spine street running far, far past with green infrastructure and lots of tree planting so that exemplifies that part of the guidance um, the, sec the second section is about density and mixed uses, and it's about making that most efficient use of land. It's, it's, it's a precious resource. Um, many of these sites will be greenfield sites. Um, some will be urban regeneration in the city centre, but where we are um, reusing this land, we need to make sure we make the best use of it. Um, there's a target of 35 dwellings per hectare, which is obviously quite an abstract term. But what that means is that the, the example on the right hand side there is the Gwyn Vine scheme. Um, which went, which was been been to planning committee maybe 18 months or so back as, a, as an approved scheme for the two housing associations working together. So that's 35 dwellings per hectare, which makes good use of the site whilst extensive green infrastructure, um, open space addresses all the flood and surface water drainage considerations. So that's the sort of thing we're talking about in this guidance. What it what, what it doesn't mean is lots and lots of what's say, called a monoculture of lots and lots of these detached houses that are barely detached or one kind of home across a whole site. So it requires a more mixed approach to these developments and mixed approaches are good because it supports a mixed community, including the integration of affordable homes. Third section is blue and green infrastructure, which emphasises the importance of working with that landscape in ecology. There is now what's called the section six ecology duty. So that's the net gain. So it's not just about mitigating um, the development. It's actually about improving the ecological um, habitats on site and it's for people to live alongside that nature. And one of the key things that comes out of this is this concept of green infrastructure at all scales. So it's not just the great big um, parks around the edges, it's bringing the green right down to the street level. Almost every house has a direct, direct or an angled view of a tree or a green space from its front windows. So it's really bringing that green into the heart of the place and it links to the um, emerging biodiversity SPG. It's also about making those connections. Um, so this is the fourth section about, you know, as I've mentioned before, designing for walk walkable neighbourhoods. So it's connecting up streets. That's the key thing, not cul-de-sacs. These are slow speed streets. So these aren't busy, busy streets where so, so cars and pedestrians can coexist. It's also about connecting up ecology. So obviously not pockets of green space. You've got this example there, the, the sort of example of a scheme that has a hedge and that becomes a green corridor as a movement route and as an ecology connection. So Open spaces are really important. As I mentioned before, during the pandemic, we're all making um, extensive use of our local parks. Um, we, we can't go far, but we can really get out into the green space that's close to our homes and our neighbourhoods. An example there on the right hand side there, which is a scheme will be coming for you soon, which is the garden village detail, um, which has been approved to outline. It's a fantastic new parkland at the centre of a new place. So it's about um, a variety of spaces from formal parks, the big park, they're like on the screen there, including little pocket parks right near sort of like door, doorstep parks, really kind of close to people's homes. Um, it's including play in terms of what's called the fields in trust standards about the kinds of ratios of play space for different ages and different abilities. And even in, even the guidance emphasised the importance of local food production. So not not that it could be allotments, but it could also be community orchards and what's called foraging trails and those sorts of things. So it's getting people more in touch with their landscape. Then we've got guidance on streets. 
um, and the whole the key thing is streets as active and social places so not just conduits for movement not just places for cars to zoom up and down at 30 miles an hour um, so it's it's about achieving a hierarchy of low speed streets that are connected up that you can feel safe crossing the road at any location you can park on street and there are places where people can can meet and interact and, and what that does do so it's been it's been cut off at the bottom of that last bullet point it links to the emerging highway street design guide which the authority is working on to make sure the whole authority embraces this place making approach so we, we the, and these are two examples of two schemes or the same scheme parts of different parts of the same scheme on the screen that are currently being negotiated with the engagement of our highway officers to create these street places within these developments that fit the vehicles in but don't let them dominate. It's about inclusiveness. We've got to make sure the public realm is accessible. We've got to make sure the buildings are accessible. Lots of these projects will have new schools and new public buildings, so they have to meet the Equalities Act and make sure that the whole community can use those spaces. Um, and it's also about the townscape. It's about the way those buildings are joined and arranged to make sure that they are interesting and well defined. It doesn't necessarily mean a particular architectural style. That's the important thing to know is placemaking can have contemporary buildings, very modern buildings. Placemaking can have very traditional buildings. That's that's not fundamental to it. It's not really about how things look as long as they're good quality. So what we're talking about here on these sites is making sure we get some key frontages. Not all parts of a development of a site of a place are the same. There's going to be places that are more important, such as along a main entrance street or around a main park. Those key frontages will need greater emphasis, greater quality, certain details that actually make it a more special place. Corners are also important. The image at the top, there, they're both corner buildings, very different character, but they do the same thing, which is called turning the corner. So they've got windows on two elevations. They don't have a blank sort of a front and then a blank side um, views and then street scenes at the bottom there. It's important that we look at these places holistically, which is obviously from that first quote. They're not a lot of individual houses on a piece of paper. They're actually street scenes and they all fit together and we want to see how that whole place could look when it's finished. Then we've got the character of a place. As I mentioned, it doesn't have to be traditional. It doesn't have to be contemporary. It does have to be good quality and have sense of place. And the uplifting of these areas, there's, there's going to be some areas that will need greater emphasis on quality with better materials, with boundaries, with possibly you know, chimneys or um, features around the doors and those sorts of things, or more contemporary features um, on the frontages that, that may be linked to um, um, energy generation. Um, so get, getting those details right is important. Community safety is important to make sure these places are accessible and they feel safe, um, that people will be happy to walk and cycle those those local distances. And it's a really simple concept of eyes on the street, making sure you've got what's called natural surveillance or active frontages and you can find where the front doors are. So again, we know what works from traditional places. It's just making sure that we don't lose sight of that in the new place. Not only is the place good, is making sure the homes and the garden, and during the pandemic, the importance of gardens is important, and for flower, it might be a balcony, it might be a garden, or it might be if they have on a balustrade to get let the outside in. Um, it's really important to have that sense of openness to properties and if you can to go straight outdoors. Got to make sure that the, the typical considerations of planning amenity, overlooking, overshadowing, overbearing is addressed. Got to make sure that there's enough space to store our waste because we know obviously there's going to be more recycling, less frequent collections potentially, and we don't necessarily want bags piled up everywhere where they shouldn't be so they can be designed in as features. Um, and finally, one of the key things we've we've been well, we've got in the current guide and we're looking to update is what's called space standards and what this is it's it's this it's, it's the sizes of the homes and i've put an extract of the table at the bottom there which is which comes from the nationally described uh, minimum space standards to make sure these homes are big enough for living to make sure they've got enough space for the number of occupants they're intended for and to make sure they've got enough space for storage so we could have a fantastically designed place but if the homes are too small it's never really going to establish as a cohesive community because people maybe won't be able to want to stay in their homes for a long time and they'll always be moving on so we want to make sure these homes are fit for living um, and then finally, last slides for me is these the reality of these new places that are created is that people will have cars. Um, it will be gradually moving towards electric vehicle charging. Um, so the cars have to be fitted in, but don't let them dominate. So it's a mixture of parking on the plots, parking on the streets, 
um, and making sure that that parking is integrated into the placemaking. So that's the run through of those 12 sections of the updated residential design guide. As I said, it's not a fundamental rewrite. It's an update to what we currently have based on what we know works well and to bring it up to date with those national agendas um, and some of the experiences of negotiating some of the strategic sites. And I'm going to hand over now to Christina to talk about the other two guidance documents. Thank you, Steve. Can everybody hear me OK? <laughs> um, so the second document, which has been updated, is the placemaking guidance for infill and backland development. Like the guidance for residential development, this document is underpinned by a placemaking approach in accordance with the LDP's placemaking policies. Importantly, infill and backland development allows for new homes to be embedded into existing communities, therefore creating sustainable and cohesive communities. So in terms of infill development, this is a, resi a residential development that is located in a gap site, so between existing buildings within a street frontage, and backland development comprises small-scale development to the rear of existing dwellings. So there's no density target for infill and backland schemes. However, development of this nature is typically on small sites where the number of dwellings is generally less than 10. So moving on to the next slide. The document then provides a helpful step-by-step -step approach to the design process. This includes the requirement to fully appraise the context and the guidance notes the benefits of seeking pre-application advice. Um, also the importance of a design and access statement is set out as this gives the opportunity to justify and explain the design evolution of a proposal. And then moving to the next slide, as Steve has explained, um, placemaking principles are at the heart of the Council's strategic planning agenda. The fundamental aim being to create buildings and places where people want to live, work and spend time. So updates have been made to the guidance to provide advice on biodiversity, green infrastructure and SUDs in light of the changes since the original document was adopted in 2014. As well as relevant for larger scale developments, these principles are then fed down to smaller scale infield and backland schemes. The guidance provides examples of ways biodiversity can be enhanced, along with guidance on multifunctional GI and SUDS features at plot and local levels. So, for example, on plot features may include green roofs, rain gardens or the retention of trees and street level features may include swales, sweet, uh, street trees and green verges. Um, additionally, the document notes that these developments will trigger the need for SAB, so guidance on SUDs at plot and street level is also set out. In terms of residential amenity, the guidance remains largely unchanged. However, the section has been updated to acknowledge the importance of internal living spaces. So the document now includes reference to the minimum space standards for new homes, along with the previous advice on minimum garden sizes separation distances etc. Um, a further point which is especially pertinent given the current Covid situation is the provision and access of usable and comfortable outdoor amenity space for all homes so this also includes the importance of providing balconies to all flats above ground floor level. Then moving on to the following slide the document is then split into two sections the first relating specifically to infill development. So this is fundamentally infilling gaps in the existing street frontages. A list of criteria is set out for the applicant to follow. For example, development should incorporate existing features, respect established building lines and should be of a height, scale and massing similar to existing dwellings in the streetscape. The priority with infill development is respect and the character of the street scene. And then the following slide, um, the guidance for backland development is also broken down into a list of crit criteria, as you can see on the slide here. Uh, the nature of this type of development, which often comprises landlocked sites such as rear gardens, means that it's not always as visible in the street scene. However, the same level of good design should be applied. In particular, backland developments should generally be subservient in scale in relation to frontage properties to avoid overdevelopment of the site and ensure there is no overbearing impacts on adjacent properties. Overall, the existing infill and backland development guidance has been widely used and well received 
And whilst the document has been updated to reflect changes to national and local planning policy and guidance, the general criteria checklist for preparing and assessing um, infill and backland developments is largely unchanged, just updated where necessary. And then moving on to the final document, the placemaking guidance for householder development. This, this guidance is important in terms of sustaining existing communities by allowing residents to improve or extend their property whilst protecting neighbouring amenity. So this allows for householders to remain within their communities and adapt their homes to meet changing needs over time. The document is split into, into a number of sections to provide guidance for different types of houses and has been updated to align with current permitted development rights, which since the original document was adopted in um, 2008, have undergone various changes allowing householders to carry out more works without the need for planning permission. So then the following slide. In terms of the overarching considerations, the document is updated to acknowledge that in some instances, although rarely, alterations will trigger SAB and guidance is again given on sustainable drainage systems at plot level. The guidance goes on to explain the concept of green infrastructure at all scales. From an individual householder perspective, GI will predominantly comprise local on-plot features, such as hedge boundaries or green roofs. And the document also sets out general amenity considerations, the key considerations being avoiding overlooking, overshadowing and overbearing impacts. And then specific guidance is provided highlighting the key design principles for works to different types of dwellings. For example, the image on the slide shows a detached dwelling with a, an appropriate two storey side extension. It's set back from the building line, down from the ridge line and with a roof pitch to match the existing dwelling. The guidance then goes on to look at other types of development, such as outbuildings, garages, decking, boundary treatments, etc. All of which can have an impact on the street scene and the amenity of neighbouring occupiers. So fundamentally, this design this design guidance has been written to be used by the householder and therefore the information and examples provided for each type of development are aimed to be simple and straightforward to be understood. And then the final slide um, outlines an update amendment to the document since being circulated for committee. So you can see paragraph 3.39 on page 20 of the document has been substituted with the amending text, which is shown on this slide. The reason for this amendment is for consistency with paragraph 3.29 um, to reference a 15 meter back to side separation distance in terms of overlooking and overbearing impacts. So looking at the next steps, So we will, we will be um, planning a six week public consultation with stakeholders. Um, this will be a COVID safe consultation, so maybe slightly different to um, some consultations that have been carried out in the past. And the aim will be to report back to for adoption as SPG, hopefully um, summer 2021. Thank you. And now over to any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you both. Excellent. Are there any questions, members? Any points you'd like to make or ask? Um, Will, Will Councillor Evans? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, a point of clarity, really. Lots of emphasis uh, on green spaces, verges, etc., in the plan. Um, I got a slight concern regarding who will be responsible for maintenance of the, these areas. Will, for example, the whole site be handed over for adoption by the council, or as is present, sometimes it's only highways, roads, and street lighting. So there's a bit of a grey area there for me. I mean, these areas are, are, look lovely, but if they're not maintained, you know, it'll be a disaster. Okay. Um, did you want to answer them one by one? Uh, Would it be better if we answered one by one rather than all at the end? Is that preferable? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, OK. Um, yeah. This, thank you, Councillor Evans. And that's that's an important point. Obviously, with all this open space, who looks after it? That's a you know, question a question there that we all need to be mindful of. And in the guidance, we emphasize that these space emphasize these spaces should be um, past adoption for the council um, with a community. Um, so the appropriate maintenance cost will be tra um, transferred across um, to keep these areas looking good. But obviously, as natural areas, maybe they're going to be maintained in a slightly more um, informal way rather than mowing very, very, very regularly. So, so yes, adoption is important. Maintenance is important. If they're not off for adoption, then we would make sure that there's a management plan in place um, so they are properly looked after. But obviously, the preference is they're looked after by the council. And that's in the guidance. OK. Just, just to come in, Chair, if, um, if that's OK, just to add to that, um, the, I think the other important point that Councillor Evans' uh, question raises is uh, uh, go, goes back to our, uh, you know, what one council approach and the importance of these design guides sitting alongside, for example, the new streets design guide um, produced by the transportation and highways section of the council, uh, you know, that they, they have to be aligned whatever we plan for um, and facilitate it as, well, as, as a planning authority has to be uh, agreed to um, and meet the requirements of our highways authority and the drainage authority. You know, these are increasingly these, these, these streets need to form a multifunctional purpose, whether it's providing that drainage, whether it's providing the biodiversity um, and, um, you know, all, all of those elements have, a, have an impact uh, in terms of uh, as a highway authority and they need to be prepared um, and in a position to be able to adopt uh, these these streets in their new form you know that they don't look uh, many of them won't look like your traditional um, uh, traditional highway so um, we, we very much built that into the document but also our ways of working uh, and um, that, that, that that's just going to be increasingly important as a council that we've got all these these, these different departments uh, singing to the same uh, same song. In order, there, Chairman. So. All right, Councillor Mike Lewis. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, uh, Steve. Just a, a couple of things. Um, the new minimum size of new houses. Uh, does that mean that the end price of these new houses will be now more expensive? Uh, and the other thing is, uh, obviously, I'm quite happy and uh, quite delighted with what with the presentation. But the only reservation I have is, are we now in danger of no developments as these changes are adding to the cost to the developer? And the developer might find that the uh, the overall price of, of, of developing is, is is far too high for him to uh, get get what he wants at the end and make a profit, basically. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, th thanks, um, Councillor Lewis, on that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's important that we make sure these aren't just good places, that the homes are good to live in as well. So that's where the space standards come from. They're not space standards necessarily we have created in Swansea. They're space standards from um, nationally described space standards that I think come, come from England in terms of Westminster because there isn't necessarily anything in Wales at the moment. And it's making sure that these houses have that space obviously for living and storage. Um, and, it, and obviously we do have for housing associations, we have the, um, um, the DQR standards that make sure they're, they're of suitable sizes. So. Yeah, we are finding that this is something that we need to focus more on for these developers and these developments. Typically, we are using them a lot, not necessarily on housing developments, but on um, the residential conversions in the city centre, um, where there's you know some redundant commercial space converted to a number of flats, and we find some of those flats can be very, very small. Um, and it's making sure um, that we're not having substandard living environments there. Um, but then that crosses over to the next, your, your, your other questions about obviously 
what impact does this have on development? And obviously, we need to make sure these new places are built, are created, are lived in, um, and that this, 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 this certainly is not intended to be a block um, to development. If it does mean that some of the viability aspects need to be looked at, and I'm sure Tom will come in in a moment, then there's a chance to look at that viability in the round. If some of these things do mean that there's additional costs to a developer, that might mean that some of these other contributions need to be looked at as well um, in terms of, you know, placemaking being holistic and delivered. Um, I think I'll hand over to Tom to talk about development viability because that's an important cross link to this guidance of you know good quality places um, and actually making sure we can construct them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say that that, that is, you know, that the, the viability issue um, and, and the development economics is the other side of the coin when it comes to, to placemaking and we have our eyes fully open to that. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right, Council, that we, that we don't um, take, take our eye off the ball um, in, in, in that respect, that the, we have a, a process inbuilt within the, the authority for assessing the viability of, of schemes and where we feel that something over and above has been asked for, for good reason, um, whether it's you know, financial contributions towards something or whether it's a, a very specific aspect of the development itself uh, and, and as the cost attributed to that, then we will have to look at uh, the, the implications of that in viability terms and what that does to, uh, for example, the delivery of, um, uh, of affordable homes on a, on a scheme. You know, we, we, it, it, sometimes there will come a point where that number would be reduced um, to take account of contributions that are being paid elsewhere um, or the um, uh, the specific elements of a of a scheme, but you know I use that as an example. But to, you know you, you won't be surprised to hear that the provision of affordable homes is is, is so high up on our uh, agenda as uh, as officers as much as much as it is you know politically for our our council, and um, there, there there would have to be uh, you know overwhelming reason. Um, and I mean that in terms of, you know, on an exceptional basis to reduce the amount of uh, affordable that, 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 that that's provided on a on a scheme. Uh, ultimately, I think you know, what we're striving for through the, this guidance is, is a quality of development and a quality of home that is going to have a bearing on the, the sale price as well. Uh, and that that offers. The, the potential for for developers to to sell their product at, at a higher price, um, and that contributes towards the overall uh, gross development value of a um, of a scheme. So that 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 should be beneficial uh, uh, for the for the overall viability uh, of that development. Um, Councillor Mike White. Yes, thank you, Chair. Two points, if I could. Chair, page 91 in regards to parking standards is a section of the, the document there that obviously has to be completed. Can we have assurance that the, the, this section will be completed uh, of the document and updated uh, and, uh, and, 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 and for it to be included in the final document? Following a six week consultation period, there's a little section there where it says the needs to obviously be further updated. And on Appendix B within the infill and background development uh, section, uh, page 147.240 relates to the GAWA AONB. It says subject to change. Uh, can you explain what does this actually mean with the change? Thank you, Chair. Okay, so, sorry, Councillor White, can you just mention the second, your second point? There was a page number there. I was just trying to write it down, but I wasn't quick enough. Yeah, page um, page one four seven, Steve. One it's in relation to seven. it's Thank in you. relation to the GAWA AO, AONB. It says subject to change. What does this this invo okay. involve? involve? Yep. So okay. Thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, I, w I won't put those specific pages up on screen, um, but what, what, what you have flagged there is that these um, these SPG documents do not exist in isolation. We have, uh, I don't know exactly how many, a suite of 
15 to 20 supplementary planning guidance documents um, in Swansea, all, all linking into the development plan, some of which you've seen recently been updated and some of which are future, as Tom mentioned earlier, future programmes for updates. So the GAO AOMB that you mentioned in there, Councillor White, is in the process of being updated, uh, sorry, updated, sorry, in parallel. So in, in, in some instances, both design guides or both documents will relate. So the Gower design guide relates more to the quality and character and essence of Gower. And then the infill and backland design guide might sort of shape how those couple of houses or even a single house fits into a plot in a certain way. So that note there was just to say that as and when the Gower design guide is amended and adopted, that will be reflected in that document. So they're kind of almost to be read together for certain developments. And the same thing as well for the parking standards, that's in a separate supplementary planning guidance document, which is programmed to be updated as well. So effectively, um, your first point there is that this, the residential design guide document explains how the parking should be integrated um, in a positive way and not dominant, but the actual number of parking spaces, depending on where that site's located, is in a separate, doc, separate, separate pl supplementary planning and guidance document. I hope that makes sense. Basically, there's quite a lot of things to cross-refer to each other, and we're just making sure that those, those hooks and those linkages are there in the different documents. Thank you, Steve. Um, ne next is uh, Councillor Linda Tyler Lloyd. Linda. Thank you. Um, this is uh, a bit sort of off, off the sort of rules, really, but I'd be grateful if you could answer this question anyway. Um, would this affect, would this new ruling affect a retrospective decision? Can I just explain? In a row of semi-detaches in Mayo's Road, um, someone applied for permission, uh, which was granted, for them to build an extra room on top of the roof, which means that the line of houses will not be sort of, you know, um, will, will be out of sync. Um, now, these people haven't taken up this, this planning permission, and I bumped into the neighbour who objected last week in the park, and they said, when these people move on, and the uh, permission sort of is perhaps out of date. Would this rule affect the decision for the next people coming in? Could they still build this extra roof? Or are you sort of all the things that you're saying about today, you know, would it not be um, suitable? OK, um, uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Tyler Lloyd. Um, if that planning application, obviously, without knowing the specifics of a certain one, if that planning application is still live, um, i.e. not necessarily been implemented, but it's still within that five year window of the decision date, then the, the guidance cannot be replied, as you say, retrospectively. But as and when or if and when that application maybe lapses, i.e. when it goes outside of the five year date and then whoever owns that property or a property would need to reapply, then the guidance in force at that time will be applied. So, okay. so, 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 so that's the situation on that one. So that's clear. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Councillor Burtonshaw. Jim? Yes, thank you. Um, I know we have a number of small schemes in our development plan. When do we start consultation with neighbours, etc., uh, before we implement the scheme? OK, thank you, Councillor Burtonshaw. Obviously, um, in some instances, um, the councillor, so sorry, the council is a developer with our More Homes programme. So, 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 oh, sorry, there's lots, there's lots of echoes. Sorry. Um, so, in those instances where it's a council project, we would do effectively uh, uh, the 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 development part of the council would do that. Analyzed um, with that community. Um, <clears throat> if it's a planning application then it will be done as and when the application is submitted. So, so yeah, there, there is the emphasis on the developer to do their own consultation up front. On the larger sites, on what's called the major developments, there's a, there's a statutory requirement set by Welsh Government to do some pre-consultation um, with those communities. Uh, but it is something that we need to um, you know, encourage and support the developers to make sure that they do those consultations to really understand those communities. It might be those communities simply don't want the development, but it gives the communities the opportunity to shape those places created, to shape the places where their children may live um, and where people can become part of that community. So yeah, engaging is really important as early as possible. 
um, and in some instances the council is actually doing that engagement as a developer itself. Yeah, right, uh, Councillor Black. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This is more a point than a question because I think it slightly goes beyond planning. But um, to what extent is this approach to development um, cross-cutting um, within the council? So I'm thinking in particular, I mean, highways. A number of major highway schemes have the effect of considerably changing the environment in which they're in. Kingsway is a good example of that, active travel um, arrangements, etc. And clearly they don't need planning permission. The highways goes ahead and does them anyway. So I'm just wondering when, when you come to design schemes like this, which are going to have an impact on a community, how does the council ensure that these sort of principles apply to, to those, those developments which are taking place outside of the planning framework? OK, um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Black. Obviously, this the guidance before you today is for residential developments, which might be mixed use developments, which might be quite busy places, as I've mentioned, um, some of the strategic development sites such as Park Mauer, Otlanga Velach, that will have busy spine streets, which will have communities, local centres and schools and all those sorts of mixed uses going on. Um, we do have, as Tom mentioned, close working relationships within our departments, with highways especially, to make sure that these streets are active and social spaces, not simply just these vehicle um, conduits, um, and to make sure they deal with sustainable drainage, green infrastructure, all those things that we've mentioned um, as well. And, and in parallel to this, we've got the, the highway street design coming out, um, which which is a more a more informal guide, but which guides through the basically takes the placemaking through to the adoption stage. The projects you mentioned there, Councillor Backer, are, are the kind of direct direct public realm projects that the council would carry out principally as part of its city regeneration agendas. So they would be you know, designed by the council council's consultants engaging with communities and stakeholders as those designs are prepared i know there was extensive engagement for example on kingsway with the with this you know the, the the traders and the the people who who live and work in that area um and that and that project they're making sure that it's um designed as a place um very much along there's a there's a well, a uk-wide document called manual for streets to make sure these are places for people, not dominated by vehicles. So this this placemaking agenda applies to all functions of the council, not just the planning regulatory services. Um, and I think well, what I've experienced and what I've seen, we are um, good at achieving that in the city centre regeneration as well as these developments. So I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. And uh, my last question is Councillor Mary Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got an, a number of questions and they're things that have uh, bothered us on a um, planning committee for quite a while. Um, it's about uh, materials. We make mention in the guidance about materials and there's a very nice photo showing a tree uh, in Millwood Gardens. If you'd scroll, I've taken the photo higher up the road and you've seen how bad uh, the sides of the buildings are uh, because we allowed them to have a different type of render. Um, also, you make uh, reference to permeable driveways. Now, there's a very nice photo of the block with the grass growing through it, but it, a lot of the guidance only says the word consider. And I want to know why uh, do we, um, we can't do it for the ones that have obviously done their driveways, but can we enforce that they are permeable driveways? Um, it's the same you say consider, uh, or they're not, uh, they should be avoided, uh, fast growing conifers. When you're talking about hedging, why can't we say you cannot plant Leylandii or fast growing uh, conifers because they're not much good for uh, the environment and they do cause a lot of neighbourly disputes and I don't think they're much uh, good for uh, the wildlife either. Uh, also, you've got um, two different uh, references for nesting birds. One you say the 1st of March, the 31st of August, and the other says, which we, I thought, used was the 1st of March, the 31st of September. Uh, so I think we need to have a look at that. And my last point is consider photovoltaic um, panels. Why are we saying consider? Why aren't we insisting 
uh, in some countries, you have to have the panels, but it does also make uh, reference to um, a small wind turbine. Well, I don't think many people want those in their gardens. So can we have some sort of uh, reassurance that we're going to be far more um, strict with what people can do and make sure that we do have things, i.e. permeable driveways and all the other things that we need to um go for a green uh, infrastructure and you know green buildings thank you okay um, thank you councillor jones i think because obviously there's three documents as part of this consultation i i think your comments there potentially mainly relate to the householder design guides um where i think some where some of those um yeah most is, is it from the householder yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah. There thank is you one, um, there is one in c yeah. i forgot I think okay. it's about the community consultation and about engaging young people, sorry. And I wanted to know how you were going to be able to do it because you rightly say in the document, they are the ones that will be living in these houses in the future. So I wanted a bit more about that. Sorry. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, ultimately, um, these are guides that expand on the, the policy framework. So so they, they, they basically set out what's expected, but they cannot insist on certain approaches because in some instances one approach may be appropriate elsewhere something else could be differently appropriate but it suggests the sort of the likely things the council is going to be expecting such as you know, materials we all know the issues with render but some renders can work well provided they're well applied in the right location with all the right um, anti-fungicidal coatings and whatever goes in if that's appropriate so so we can't say no render but it's just making sure the materials are high quality and appropriate to that place but we do generally try and sort of steer away from schemes that are 100 percent render and we know that some schemes in swansea you know, unfortunately don't look good with with their render in terms of some of the other things you mentioned there about the permeable drives um conifers and and, and and the like they're very much things that we're sort of sort of guide people on but we can't necessarily insist on in terms of permeable drive that's one way permeable surface driveways which might let the water percolate through is possibly one way to address um, sustainable drainage requirements but not the only way you might have a hard paved drive that drains into like a little attenuation area like a rain garden it's called like a little sunken area that can be planted up so it's a suggestion and also with householder developments they possibly wouldn't um, trigger the formal need for drainage um, consent so, so it's it's very much suggesting on those things, whereas, whereas on, on the larger developments, there are mandatory drainage requirements, but there's often more than one way to do them. And there's a separate guide almost on drainage in its own right. Um, again, the conifers is part uh, the conifers links into some of the biodiversity considerations, which is a separate supplementary planning guidance document, um, which is sort of seeking to avoid those issues that come from there. We will check out the issue you flagged with the nesting birds if we have got um, conflicting or incorrect dates. And obviously that's important. We need to make sure that's correct. Um, you mentioned considering photovoltaics. Again, in terms of energy efficiencies, it's one thing to generate energy, but it's another thing to conserve energy. And it might just be a well insulated house is a better way of doing it rather than the technology that comes with photovoltaics. Um, so it's a suggestion rather than an assistance there. Um, and finally, you mentioned um, con consultation, especially consultation with younger people. And um, that's something we will need to do um, as a planning authority to make sure that they are these future generations are engaged on the draft shaping of the draft draft guidance but then it's making sure and supporting developers in their projects when they're preparing their actual designs to engage with those communities um, and those young people in those localities so it's making sure first and foremost that we engage on the supplementary planning guidance documents with those younger people which we haven't quite worked out how to do that there's there's better parts of the council who we can speak to um, and obviously making sure we are going to do this in a you know, covid safe way uh, maybe seeking if we can to link into some schools and the like and those sorts of things but we we, we haven't shaped that yet but we know it's important uh, tom i can i can see tom evans has got his hand up Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I I just wanted to pick up on on this the point that, that Councillor Jones has made here. I, I I've got a lot of a lot of sympathy with what the point you've raised here about um, the use of language, and you know sometimes you think, well, what, what what's the point in saying should consider this and that if if you're going to say it, um, if you're going to raise the issue, then um, 
uh, be a bit more categorical in terms of what we expect as a planning authority. And um, I understand. Uh, I can say I've got sympathy with that point, and I, I can, I can commit to to certainly us doing uh, an audit through the. Uh, through the consultation process to an audit of all three documents and, and see where we think that there could be a tightening up of the, of the language and sometimes for example as a way of approaching it um, of, uh, of explaining where there is a requirement in in policy uh, for uh, developers and applicants to 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 achieve uh, a certain requirement and you can explain that this particular measure, whether it's the photovoltaic panel or whatever, this is a way that you developer can meet your requirement that is set out in policy. So there is a slightly different way of approaching it. And I think we'll we'll do we'll go through that process and we'll see where um, um, where there is there is room, as I say, for that kind of uh, greater uh, clarity and, and tightening up of, of, of the language. But but the point that Steve makes is right in terms of the this is this is these are guidance documents. This is planning guidance. It can't create policy of its own and new um, uh, new requirements that aren't founded on uh, adopted development plan policy. But um, uh, notwithstanding that, um, I, I think there will be there'll be room during the consultation process for us to uh, um, pick up on some of the um, the areas that you raised. Thank you. Uh, Councillor yeah. Des Thomas. You're on mute, Des. Oh. Um, Councillor Des Thomas, put your hand up. No, that's not working because he's off mute. Look. Technical issues. Councillor Thomas. No. Okay. 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 Well, thank you. Um, thank you all. Excellent presentations and um, some excellent questions on debate there. Um, did you and Tom and Steve, Christine, did you want to sum up or are you happy to? Um, thank you, Chair. If, if I could just briefly just sum up and obviously to, to thank councillors for their questions, um, to remind us all that this, these are draft documents, so they, they can be shaped. And the um, the recommendation is to is to obviously go out to that consultation with that small change to that paragraph in um, Appendix A, just it's, it's that small change that Christina described there. And you know, obviously, we hope to report back in the summer time, which will have one of these extensive schedule of all the comments made, the consideration of those comments, and how, how the document would be shaped with those those inputs from those communities and stakeholders. So, thank you for all that. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And uh, I must say, it's been excellent presentation and debate there. And oh, Castor Lewis. Yeah, sorry, just one question uh, to Steve. When do you envisage these new changes being implemented? What, what's the time scale? That's that's what I want to know, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, yeah, and thank you, Councillor Lewis. There. Obviously, um, from today on, on the basis that they are approved for consultation, we need to sort out some of the final formatting. We need to make sure they're obviously produced bilingually. So there's a bit of lead in time there. We hope to go out to consultation, let's say springtime without without committing ourselves to any specific months. Um, as we said, you know, arranging like the online consultations um, with the you know, as, you know, assessment of the comments made, the collation of the final documents, aiming to report back to planning committee in the summer. I would probably say later summer. Um, and at, the, at that committee in, in the summertime, fingers crossed, um, it would be approved and adopted as the new supplementary planning guidance, which from that day on becomes the effective documents. So as and when they come back, that's when they will start to be used in planning decisions. So it should, should be by end of the summer this year. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, as I say, um, excellent presentations, debate and discussion. Um, 
I can't see any other hands up now. So we will now move to the uh, vote on the recommendation, which you see at the beginning of the document there, is that uh, the recommendation is that we approve the placemaking guidance for householder development, infill and backland development and residential developments for public and stakeholder consultation. So you will shortly see your... Uh, with, with that small amendment. With, yes, yeah. sorry, yes, yeah. with, the, with the amendment that we've had. Thank you. There we are. Launch a poll now, everyone. There we are. The voters should be on screen or in your chat now. Has everybody voted? Yes. Mm -hmm. I might be for right. it. Yeah, I'm in favour. Um, I don't think everyone has voted. It's seven, eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. Got to go on. Ten. Ten. It's eight votes, and it says one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah there should be eight. Yeah, Ch Chairman, it was both verbally, so yeah. I, that's another one four. So we've got one missing. Has somebody not voted? Or somebody having technology problems? I wonder if it's Des. It's Des. So, Des. Got his, uh, got hand hand raised, Des. so yeah, I wonder whether he's got a technical issue. Yeah, it looks like it. Passed anyway now. Can you hear us, Councillor Thomas? Do you want to vote verbally? Or if you're in favour, if you can raise your hand and we can see that then. Yep, there we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So that's, that's unanimous. Thank you all. Excellent. That's approved. Yeah, that's, that's approved. Good. And with that, obviously, then we'll go to consultation. And uh, again, thank you all very much for this morning. And uh, see you again very soon. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. 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 Bye.